All right, everybody, I'm going to uh, get started. Um, I'm Andrew Smeal from Hindawi, and I'm here to talk about uh, the work that Hindawi is doing with COCO and the COCO community, um, and sort of more broadly about open source projects uh, to make software for scholarly communications. So uh, really quickly, uh, who Hindawi is, in case anyone's not familiar with us, we're a fairly large publisher of open access journals. So we publish about 250 uh, uh, journals in all areas of STEM and medicine. It's, it, we're exclusively Gold OA. In 2007, we kind of flipped our few remaining subscription journals to Gold OA. So, um, you know, and there you have a, a rough sense of, of our scale. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a little bit of, a, of an analogy that I think might um, say something sort of interesting about, about uh, competition and innovation in software. Um, so this graph is, is looking at the, the browser wars. This is the market share of internet browsers between 1996 and 2009. And that, um, that big blue mountain you see in the middle is the, the rise and fall of Internet Explorer. Um, so the, the dark green piece there is Netscape. And before 1995, there was only Netscape. And they had basically the entire market. Um, in 1995, Windows releases Internet Explorer. They bundle it with Windows. I think everyone knows this story. Uh, because it's bundled with Windows, they create this proprietary stack of software. People use it because it's there. It takes over the whole market. And they choke the air out of Netscape. And Netscape, with its sort of dying breath there around 2003, um, open sources its code base and gives it to the uh, Mozilla Foundation. And then that red phoenix emerging from the ashes of Netscape is, is Mozilla and Firefox and the browsers in that family. And you can see they start to take back um, market share from Internet Explorer. And this graph stops just before the next big thing, which was, which was Chrome. Um, this, this crazy slide is looking at all the version releases of every major Internet browser. And I think, although this is kind of a, a very rough proxy for anything about innovation, uh, I think the pattern here at least matches up with that previous graph in an interesting way. So I'm going to highlight three lines on this chart. Um, maybe I am. Oops, there we go. So um, here's Internet Explorer. So this, uh, the, the timing of these things doesn't quite match up. Internet Explorer, this is 2001 when Internet Explorer achieves that effective monopoly. So you can see between 2001 and 2004, six and seven, Internet Explorer releases one new version of their software. Um, now, in that time, uh, in 2000, uh, between 2003 and 2004, just before Internet Explorer releases version seven, you have Firefox come in. And you can see the releases of Firefox, this open, open, uh, open source project, um, uh, are much faster. Their new versions are coming out much faster than Internet Explorer. And you can see Internet Explorer kind of has to respond. Uh, you know, right now they're mucking around with things like Silverlight and trying to force people to use these uh, proprietary things and fighting against web apps um, because, you know, they think web apps might take down Office. Um, then in 2009, which lines up sort of with the four there of uh, the version four of Firefox, you have Chrome come out. And then you can see what Chrome does to the marketplace. All of a sudden, the, 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 the acceleration of releases within Firefox, you know, it just goes insane. Um, and you go from version 4 to version 59 uh, in, in, in there. And I think now we're on version 62 of Firefox and version 69 of Chrome. Um, and then you can see finally with Edge, uh, Internet Explorer tries to respond in the last couple of years. But I think what you see here is that when you don't have effective competition in a market, that can lead to um, stifling change, stifling growth, stifling innovation. And that's why it's so important to have um, healthy competition. And I think open source is an important part of that. Um, so why is this relevant to scholarly communications? Uh, there's a quote there from, from Jeff Builder and Jennifer Lynn of Crossref and Cameron Nalen, who's here. Um, we have uh, big companies in scholarly communications now who are in a position to create proprietary stacks of software that serve um, every point in the research cycle. And, uh, you know, that isn't inherently, there's nothing inherently wrong with that in and of itself. Um, I mean, you could argue that, uh, you know, a benevolent dictator might make, you know, positive choices. But, uh, you know, there's a real risk that if we turn over the control of scholarly infrastructure to monopolistic software providers, that it's going to uh, stifle innovation, slow down growth, slow down change, and lead to, you know, uh, not the optimal outcomes that we want. Um, so two things I think are mostly true about this market. One is that 
authors do not care about the technology of publishing software. Um, and, and Jeff Builder of Crossref, again, to paraphrase a thing he likes to say, you know, drivers don't go to conferences about how roads are paved. I think that's sort of an appropriate like example of how authors think about uh, publishing software. Um, but publishers do benefit from network effects. So um, if you control software at every, at every point of the research ecosystem, you have data that makes you able to provide a more effective service. You, you, you know, from your discovery tools, you know what authors are reading. Uh, you can help guide them through the research process. You know when they're ready to submit. You can make sure that one of your journals is in front of them at the point of deciding which journals they're going to submit to. Uh, you can make sure that papers cascade from a journal that you control to another journal that you can control. And researchers will use tools that are uh, convenient and familiar to them. So if you can be there, uh, you can sort of lock in this market and create, um, create a captive audience. Uh, so you know, at Hindawi, we're not uh, in a position to be a monopolistic provider of any kind of software. Um, so we think you know, one way to compete against this is to provide an open alternative. And it goes beyond just open source. It's, it's also about open data and the metadata about research items, uh, open integrations, open contracts, preventing things like lock-in. Uh, because a healthy marketplace um, allows people to compete on service and innovation. It doesn't make people stuck with their publisher because you know, they're locked into a long-term deal with an NDA, and you, know, the data, you can't get the data out anyway because it's in some proprietary format. That's not of benefit for anyone. Um, so, uh, you know, an alternative to this is, is an open community of people that work together to build open tools that share open standards and can integrate with each other and can build off of each other. And, um, you know, there's no reason why people need to be, um, you know, there's, it, it's not about uh, nonprofits versus commercial providers. Uh, everyone comes together in this market and everyone benefits. If you build something that's of use to the community, then it's, it's valuable regardless of who you are. Um, so in 2017, we began working with Coco to make this a reality. Um, some of the reasons why we chose Coco. Um, so the first thing here to control the development roadmap, I mean, that's not necessarily a, a unique to open source, um, but it's one of the reasons why we didn't want to go with a commercial system. We wanted something where we could experiment, try new things on our own schedule and control how fast we, um, we made changes. We uh, also, you know, the more traditional benefits of of open source, we wanted to collaborate to share costs with other people, benefit from shared expertise, so different people bring different things to the community. Um, we, we believe that by working together with other people, we reduce, we remove unnecessary variation and complexity from the system. So too many journals, you know, think that they, they need a, a bespoke workflow. I mean, that just, you know, it's true sometimes, but it's not true all the time. And by removing variation and complexity, we make things easier for authors, easier for editors, and we reduce costs uh, for publishers to, to publish. We want to achieve open science goals. And also with, you know, with Hindawi, um, you know, one of our business goals is, is you know, we don't want to get into the software business, but we sell services on top of software. And the more that we can create um, a shared user base of services, that, of software that can interact with each other, it makes it easier for us as a commercial company to sell services. So there was kind of a direct um, business benefit for us, um, which isn't necessarily true of every member of the Cocoa community, but you know, for us, that's one of the reasons we wanted to go ahead with this. So a quick example of who's working in the Cocoa community, you have eLife. Um, they're building a, a more complex uh, collaborative peer review process uh, with many stages, uh, you know, three tiers of editors. Um, Europe PMC, on the other hand, is building a really lightweight process to review metadata for items being ingested into Europe PMC. Um, UC Press, for the Collabra Journal, is building you know, a quite avant-garde, HTML-first, open peer review system where peer review happens in the browser, uh, sort of in like a, a substance-type environment. Um, and Hindawi, we're building a more traditional uh, single-blind peer review process you know, with um, less of the innovative bells and whistles like the, the doc to HTML conversion, but you know, something that could serve for a very large number of journals very easily. Um, and the point is, although we're all building different things, we are all using shared components from the PubSuite library. So we're all taking these building blocks and we're, we're mixing and matching them in different ways to build uh, unique software. And I think that shows the, the power and flexibility of what you can do with PubSuite. Now, to give an example of what we've invested here, Hindawi, um, in about nine months, released our first peer review system. We released our system about two weeks ago. It's now running on one of our peer review journals. Uh, and it took about five developers nine months to put this system together, um, which um, 
uh, you know, is, 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 uh, is still a really big investment for institutions to find five developers and, and, and make them work for nine months. It's, it's not, you know, it's not within reach for everybody. But what's really interesting is how, um, you know, the groundwork that we lay makes it easier for the next person who comes along. So eLife and Coco themselves put a huge amount of work into PubSuite Core, which we've all built off. That led us build a system in nine months. Now, uh, Europe PMC, EBI comes along, and they've, in two, three months, have been able to release a system that works for them to do ingestion into Europe PMC. So, uh, you know, everyone that comes after us is going to benefit from this. The, the, the investment that you need to make something work on PubSuite, it's getting, it's getting easier and easier. And we've just, um, we're about to increase our investment in our PubSuite team from five developers to 15 to 20 developers. So with us putting that much in, uh, e you know, eLife has a team of five to 10 developers. Uh, Europe PMC is bringing five to 10 developers to the table. This is already becoming a very big uh, community with a ton of things going on, people doing uh, projects together, um, you know, in all different areas for funders, for, for big publishers, small publishers. Um, so it's quite vibrant, and things are happening really fast right now. Um, so how does it work? Uh, this is sort of my rough attempt to answer the kind of questions that, that Juan Pablo Alperin was, was asking yesterday. I mean, I don't think this model will hold up forever, but it's how we've made it work so far, let's say. So one thing that we think is really important is having a nonprofit that governs the community. So that's Coco in this case, and that, that um, means that you can trust that if you're working with Hindawi to run a journal in Coco, um, if you don't like the service that we provide, you know, you can take that journal and go to someone else. We can't walk away with your code. Um, we can't walk away with your data because everything is, is using open standards and, and integrated and, you know, available for other developers to step in and work on. Now, a thing that we do in the Coco community that I think is really interesting is how, is the level of sharing. I think it goes beyond you know, most uh, open source projects. So we have open roadmaps that we share with each other. I can see what eLife's goals are, what they're working on. They can see what our goals are. Um, we share designs with each other, research with each other, UX with each other. Um, um, you know, I put here code is the last thing we share. I think by the time we get to share code with each other and contribute things to the code base, we've already done so much sharing before that. We've already, you know, um, uh, we've already, um, you know, you know uh, looked at different UI components, like side-by-side -side UI, and said this one's better than this, and we've talked about a shared data model, and we've made sure that, you know, everything is, is standardized and integrates, and um, that's meant that uh, we, we, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but we, we aim to not reduplicate each other's work, to make sure that everyone's aware of things that are available in the community so that you use things that are already there rather than build, uh, reinventing the wheel. And another thing that's really important is that the community is inclusive. So it's not, um, it's not just, um, you know, it's not just for librarians, it's not just for funders, it's not just for publishers. Uh, we have different people who bring different expertise to the table, which means that we all benefit from, um, you know, different points of view and, diff and understanding different use cases. And we also, um, it, it creates those network effects that are so important because the, the stuff that we build is then, um, available to these broader communities. Um, it's not just in the publishing community. Um, so why does the publishing work? Again, back to the same idea. We don't compete on technology. You know, um, we don't, uh, an author doesn't care what submission system that y your journal uses, so we don't compete with an eLife on what submission system we use. We still compete with them um, for editors, for papers. We compete with them for, um, you know, providing a good service, pr providing good peer review or uh, a fast turnaround time but we don't compete with them on technology. So uh, when we share the work there, it, it, it actually benefits both of us. Um, it means that um, researchers don't have to have different sign-ons for every journal in the world. They can use their ORCID everywhere. It means that um, when you see a workflow uh, from one journal, it's familiar. It, it's not 14 pages of forms that you have to fill out. It's two pages of forms, and you already have the data somewhere because you, you've done it before. Um, you know, the template maybe is shared across journals. Things that can be reused are reused. Um, and we, um, the collaboration works because we benefit from network effects. So the community is still small, but with, you know, with Hindawi and eLife, we're already reaching, able to reach a, a fairly large number of authors. Um, as more people come, you know, we'll reach more authors, we'll, we'll understand more use cases, we'll, we'll be able to uh, create flexibility for different disciplines where it's needed. Um, and uh, you know, an ecosystem of third-party apps will emerge to help with discoverability or reusability. 
um, you know, the more of the, the more these things are available, the more the system as a whole becomes valuable. So what's next is to extend beyond peer review to other stages of the of the process. So so eLife is working on the Libro project, which is a, a CMS project to do uh, journal websites and and um, uh, manage articles. Uh, you know, we are already many of the members of the Cocoa community are getting involved with that. Um, you have projects on. Um, semantic extraction, PDF to HTML conversion, which are really interesting. Um, and the idea is that you know, we, want, we want people who have um, interesting products and things of value to contribute to come join the community, make sure that what they build integrates with what we build, that what we build integrates with them, that people, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that uh, something like protocols.io is supported natively within the ecosystem. So um, you know, as, as we grow, uh, the entire system is, be, is going to become more and more valuable. So you don't have to take my word for it. Um, Adam Hyde is also here, and he wants to speak for a few minutes. Adam is the co-founder of Coco, and then we're happy to take questions about how the whole thing works. Thank you. And how do I move the slide on to the next? Oh, yeah. Uh, kia ora. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Adam. I'm the um, founder of Booksprints. You might hear about that later on today. Co-founder of uh, Coco and <coughs> A Shuttleworth fellow, and um, yeah, I just wanted to talk just a little bit about um, about community and um, follow on from Andrew's excellent points. Um, it's Coco is really working very effectively now as a as a community. We're building several platforms all at once. <coughs> um, it's often been um, said that building journal platforms is an intractable problem, which is ridiculous, and um, and we're proving it now. We have about three journal platforms in play. Uh, we have several, uh, we have a content aggregation platforms, micro-publication platforms, book production platforms, all built on top of um, PubSuite. And so we're trying to spread this uh, love, so to speak, and invite people to be part of this community. And um, we're trying to break down this idea that, um, you know, this is an impossible task to build a journal um, platform. Uh, Hindawi is a, uh, an amazing member of the community and, have, as Andrew said, has built it in a platform in nine months, right? And what's nice about the community is that everybody else that participates in the community can come build their systems and learn from people like Andrew, right, who have already been down this path. And they, you can um, come with your problems, you know, how to think about how to build a journal platform or whatever it is you need, and get advice from people who have already been down that path and learned a lot about it in, on the way. And it's not just Hindawi, right? We have several journal platforms all doing the same thing. Um, so there's a, there's a wealth of knowledge. And part of the sharing that Andrew's talking about is sharing these experiences and learning from each other, right? So, you know, the, this, um, sorry, the, I don't know the name of the, the protocols.io person, very nice presentation said, let's get rid of this fail fast idea. Um, one of the reasons fail fast is, um, is held up as being something worthwhile within um, Silicon Valley is because you learn from those failures. But you, there's other ways of learning, like, for example, having a lot of people doing very similar things all at once and sharing their learnings together. That's another way of approaching that problem, right? So it's a very rich environment. It's why we put out a book called um, PubSuite, subtitled How to Build a Publishing System, right? We're, we're not trying to hold on to this knowledge. We want to share it with everybody who's interested in going down this path. Uh, with us or without us, but we would hope that you would join with us because we're a fun community, um, we, we're very productive, and we can lessen, lessen the burden for you significantly to go down this path and lessen the number of errors that you're going to make and um, also lessen the, the technology uh, cost burden as well. And of course we expect you to contribute back and help other people by teaching them what you learn as well. So yeah, it's a wonderful community. I'd say that one of the most interesting things about us is that we have fun. It's very, very important. If you look at the video, I invite you to have a look at the, um, the Coco blog, coco.foundation slash blog. We've just released a little video about, gives you a little insight some of our meetings. And um, <clears throat> what you can see is people smiling and laughing while they're building journal platforms, right? So, <laughs> it's kind of a ridiculous idea, but it happens. And, um, and we very consciously develop this kind of culture. So I have some, uh, several of these books available. I think Alison uh, has a couple. Alison over there, community manager for Editoria. Um, uh, for Coco, if you uh, wish, we can give you, we just have a few, or we can send you them. Or you can look at um, coco.foundation slash books, and you can get a free PDF there as well. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew, as well.
so I think both of us are happy to answer questions about, about COCO or how it works or who's involved or what we're building. Um, so yeah, please. Uh, these tools that other people are, are building, you mentioned a metadata review tool from Europe PMC. Are those open source tools um, also sort of available for people to look at and get an idea of what they're doing and, and uh, sort of demos or something like mm -hmm. that? So, so yes, um, both uh, on your own or you know through the community. So there's an open chat uh, that we have using Mattermost, which is sort of an open source version of Slack, and anyone can join that and ask for help and ask for demos, and so, I, you know, I would invite you to come there. But uh, uh, all of the code, as far as I know, um, for any of our projects is, is either on GitLab or GitHub. So if you go on GitLab or GitHub, you can, uh, there will be instructions for how you can stand up and run any of our code, you know, and see, uh, you know, you'll need a little bit of technical knowledge to get it up and running, but you can, you can, uh, run a local version of what your, your PMC has built and see how it works. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you go on the coco.foundation website, which Adam just mentioned, there's links to all of that, all of that there. Yeah. So it, it's uh, so wonderful to see UC Press, Coco, eLive, Hindawi working together. What's the ideal number of partners working on something like this? Hundreds, five, at which point does it become unwieldy? Like, how does this work? Yeah, I, I, yeah Katrina has some theories about this, I think, about you know, the theory of tribes or how, how, what's the maximum number of people that can effectively collaborate. I think um, you know, right now there's about, what would you say, 50 or 60 people that are active, yeah. you know, that come to things or respond to things, and that's working very well. I think we're not, if we got very much bigger, there's definitely an additional level of governance that has to come in. And what's interesting is with the Libro project, we're kind of learning from the Coco project a little bit with the Libro project, where there's a little bit more governance from the beginning that we're putting in, things like license agreements for contributors and things that we maybe didn't have in place at the beginning of Coco. Um, so we're learning as we go. Right now, um, uh, you know, I would say 50, 60 people are working together really well. You know, we have community meetings every, every three months or so. You know, 50 people will come, people from Greece, people from, from Romania, from, from the UK, from the US, yeah. Yeah, I would, um, yeah. I would only add to that that the most important thing for us is that we keep um, good faith and trust within the group of people that we're working with. So we've had a lot of people come to us and say, yeah, we want to be part of this and we, we, you know, temper expectations, say, well, if you're going to come to this party, you know, you have to come dressed appropriately. <laughs> so, you know, you, you really have to come with a good feeling and you have to be transparent and wish to share what you know um, and be very open and collaborative. And so we're just building it on. We see it as we add layers to something, right? We're not just going boom. We're just adding nice layers of people who have got the right temperament to come into the community and extend it bit by bit. And we'll have challenges on scale, that's for sure, but we'll work, we'll work it out as we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, so yeah. thank you very much. Uh, excellent presentation, and I'm sure you'll be around for questions later. And so let's uh, thank the presenters. Yeah.